Hi everyone, my name is Charlie and today we're back in the living room recording my September wrap-up in November. I'm doing this because originally I was feeling too disenchanted with my wrap-ups to record one. Firstly, let's just list the books that I read in September. We have After Sappho by Selby Wynne Schwartz, Maps of Our Spectacular Bodies by Maddie Mortimer, Borrowed Scenery by Joy Winkler, The Way We Live Now by Anthony Trollope, and then we have the Booktube Prize books, which are Brickmakers by Selva Almada, translated by Annie McDermott, The Phone Box at the Edge of the World by Laura Imei Messina, translated by Lucy Rand, and the rest of the books were either library books or I've lost them, which are The Anomaly by Hervé Letalier, translated by Adriana Hunter, Disquiet by Zulfu Livinelli, translated by Brendan Freely, and The Art of Losing by Alice Senator, translated by Frank Wynne. I don't think that I'm going to do a separate video for the Booktube Prize books anymore, simply because just this year. If, if I continue to judge this next year, then I will still make a separate video. But for this moment in time, when the finalist has been announced, it's been so long since that happened. I didn't feel like I really cared about any of these books. And I felt like there was some very strong, dark topics talked about within the fiction but it, it disappointed me for the most part. The Anomaly is a book that a lot of people have been talking about as this great French literary thriller and they talked about everything it was trying to do so that's the the Anomaly is the book in which a plane lands in March and then the same plane lands in June with all the same people on it. They hit some turbulence and this has happened and this book is exploring that. It's exploring what the people have done in three months and the people who are getting off the plane thinking it hasn't been three months, having to acclimatise to the fact that they are no longer in control of their own lives. They are no longer who they went on the plane believing they were because there are now multiples of them. And I felt like this could have been a really interesting concept, but that the author didn't necessarily stretch it to its fullest ability and everything that he talked about seemed rather soap opera-ish to me. It felt like one of those what-if scenarios you might have as some sort of drunken high student at university and it went through the, not even the entire gamut of what could happen in this scenario and I just wasn't a fan which brings me on to Brickmakers, which sees these two young men in their dying moments going over their entire lives, how they began feuding with one another and how it all led to this point. This is one that I had perhaps looked forward to above a lot of the others in the translated fiction section of this prize. I wonder whether there is one that I wanted more with, whether I wanted more story, whether whether it clashed with my sensibilities in the grand scheme of things. If I wanted to, like at times I wanted to praise its brevity, but at other times I wanted it to go more in depth. And sometimes I was appreciating it being paired back and it only giving suggestions of things. Um, then we had some very violent moments with animals and I'm thinking why do we have such a heavy focus here but we don't go into the heavy focus of other things and it was one that just ended up not sitting right with me which brings me along to the phone box at the end of the world which is almost similar to the beekeeper of Aleppo for me although I did end up enjoying this more due to the aspect of it discussing grief, it does it in this almost 
this fashion where it's almost trying to be light-hearted and it's trying to make the reader feel a certain type of way but I did think there was some poetry in the prose more so than the beekeeper of Aleppo that gets mentioned on the front book. I appreciated what this book was saying about grief but it's one of those where I would have perhaps, considering it says on the back that it's inspired by a true story, I would have perhaps rather got the accounts of the people who went through this than read this fictionalised version that's only written to, well, I don't know. Is everything written to try and make the reader feel something? I think everything's written to make the reader try and feel something, but in some books it feels like the author is trying to force it more than others might. I should say as well that when I read Disquiet, it, it, like, I read Disquiet after I read Brickmakers, and that ended up making me feel somewhat sad, somewhat depressed due to the content in that story, and I had to read that book in one go because the themes within it and what it was talking about were making me so sad that I couldn't bear to go around um, with any of the anything that was in that book in my mind. So whilst other people have talked about the characters and everything that goes on in that book, I really didn't look at that at all. I simply looked at how it was making me feel in that moment and it was making me feel incredibly sad. And so I got that book out of the way and I have absolutely no idea where it is in my house right now because it saddened me. And then we had The Art of Losing by Alice Senator, which I actually thought was a very good um, generational saga and I liked the pace of it and I liked the intricacies that were shown within the family and the way in which it showed this aspect that, you know, it, it, it didn't mind showing that families don't necessarily always do the best by each other, even though sometimes they might try. I ended up disappointed by the final books in the translated fiction section of the Booktube Prize. And the reason I didn't do a wrap-up at the time was somewhat because of these, um, but also because the Booker books, I think you got to see me talk about with Charlie of Charlie Brooke a lot. After Sappho is one that I really thought that I was going to enjoy. From the first 30 pages or so, I was enjoying this vignette style. And I said at the time that I thought it was going to remind me of Ali Smith when Ali Smith was at her best. Um, which some people would disagree when that was, so let's not get into that debate. But I thought that these vignettes would come together like a jigsaw or some sort of puzzle and it would create this overall narrative, but all it did was did what Square Haunting did for me at the start of the year, except more boring, which I'm not sure whether that'll make sense to anybody, but Square Haunting, I use that as an example because it was all about these women, some of whom might have been forgotten over the last hundred years, and it used narrative techniques in order to write a very good piece of non-fiction, whereas after Sappho just gave us these very dry museum-like cards that you would read whilst looking at pieces of art. Unfortunately, there was no art within this book. And then we have Maps of Our Spectacular Bodies by Maddie Mortimer. And once I finished this, I went to Charlie and we were talking about this book because I wondered why this wasn't on the shortlist for the Booker Prize. At the same time, I really enjoyed that strong, that strong list. <laughs> I really appreciated that shortlist and there were none in my mind that I could swap out for. This is a tale about a woman with cancer in which cancer ends up giving one of the narratorial voices within the text. I could tell this was a first novel, not in a not in like a really bad sense, but I think that we didn't I don't know if cancer as a voice really added anything to the novel. I know at times it was used to talk about the character's past. It almost replaces God for our protagonist. Our protagonist comes from a very religious family, we find out, and begins to have these fears that the reason that she has got this cancer is as some sort of um, revenge for 
of leaving the Christian faith. And so I suppose that this cancer that becomes an all-seeing eye within the novel could also be seen as what has replaced God in her life. I don't know. Uh, it's definitely a book that I would go back and reread. Even though I, when I say that it's, I could tell it's a debut novel, sometimes there were tendencies to over -egg the pudding. It's still a very strong novel, a very strong debut, and I will be interested to see what the author writes in future, because it's one of those things where she's written almost a stylized book, and you wonder, is she going to continue down that vein, similar to uh, how the, what's her name, Janice Hallett is now having to come up with loads of different ways to write those murder mysteries that are somewhat different. Like we had the email string in the first book and then we got the audio in the second book and now we're apparently getting, I can't remember what the third one is, but it's a new different epistolary novel. So we'll see what Maddie Mortimer goes for in future. Then we had Borrowed Scenery by my good friend Joy Winkler. This Joy has been writer in residence at Tatton Park for years now, and this is a culmination of work that came out in time for Fern Cotton's Happy Festival, of which Joy got to go and be part of the poetry. This includes poems by Joy that she's written inspired by nature and inspired by Tatton Park, and also has poems from people who have gone to her workshops and created work there, interviews with a few staff members from Tatton and some of the people who have walked through the park as well. I think that it's a collection to read and enjoy if you like nature, if you like nature writing. They also bring in some of the folkloric fairy tale aspect which is common in Joy's poetry. I know she's incredibly worried at the moment because she worries that it might be too, because it's so much about Tatton Park that if you don't know Tatton Park, then she worries that people won't read the poems within. But I think that we have a lot of parks across this country. People are going to be able to make their own associations, or it might make you want to come and visit the park, which I also heartily recommend. And then we have The Way We Live Now by Anthony Trollope. This was a buddy read with Emily of Novel Novels over the months of... August and September. In this book, Anthony Trollope encapsulates so much. This felt like... This felt like one of those television dramas you would sit down with your family with for... with your family for on a Sunday night. It is packed full of character and story that interweave with one another. They intertwine. It discusses the evils of money. It discusses Victorian society and how a lot of these rich people don't actually own anything. Everything is on credit. And I know that when I got to... That's another book. <laughs> that was Family Parsonage. Um... But Felix Carberry, within this book, is very much ruled by money. And so are a lot of the people within this book, even though they don't actually have it. And there's a lot of gambling going on amongst the men, and they're betting money that they don't have. And everyone's taking these lines of credit and trying to, when they get into a bad way, trying to draw that credit from another person. You have one man who's definitely the villain of the piece, who's doing something with a railway. Melmot, within this book, has inspired a lot of soap opera villains. And I say this having watched a lot of soap operas, knowing that you always get that one villain who shows up and he's looking to redevelop things and take over. And they always have this period where they look like they're winning before eventually we get their decline. We see it all the time and we definitely get to see what has inspired a lot of soap operas. I would even say has inspired a lot of storytellers with this book. It is huge but it's also 
not difficult to get through. I would say in terms of Victorian writers now that I have read maybe like three, Anthony Trollope, I would say is a really great way to get into Victorian fiction because his style is very close to the modern style. I just thoroughly adore his writing, his way of crafting characters. It sounds horrible because I don't I, I don't know whether this is going to be the case for all of his books, but when I read them, I feel like everything's going to turn out right in the end, even if you're very tense worrying about what's going to happen to the characters. There is this sense that it's going to be all right in the night, so I appreciate that. I appreciate that when he writes female characters, they don't necessarily ascribe to what society wants from them. And I'll get to that more in my October wrap-up as well. But the way we live now was worth spending reading for two months. I'm most appreciative to Emily of Novel Novels for her patience with reading this one, because Lord knows I fell behind with everything else I was trying to get done. Brilliant book to settle down with and just spend hours upon hours with these characters. And... This is one of those heftier tomes I didn't mind spending time with because I was very much enjoying the reading of the thing. And there's the books. If you've read any of these books and would like to discuss them, then please feel free to do so in the comments. I hope that you have enjoyed this video, and until next time, that is all.